So this is our third podcast. It is. And yeah, so the last one we offered a constructive critique of Jordan Peterson. And in this one, uh, we're gonna go through some of the comments, the feedback um, underneath the video and on Facebook and elsewhere. Try and give a bit more context and respond to what some are really sort of valid uh, comments, criticisms, and ultimately, like, so we put out a video and I wrote a really long, I don't know if you <laughs> to get to novel. Of it, novel on uh, Medium, uh, which we'll link to under this as well. And what was interesting is sort of developing, as Peterson says, I write to know what I think. And I really felt like by writing it, I was sort of getting to know more of what I actually thought about it. And then reading people's responses, helping that kind of conversation as well. So there's, there's these two images of Peterson. One, on, the, on one side, it's like Peterson is a cult and his, his followers are just kind of idol worshipping. And, uh, and the other side, um, which I think is more true, is that Peterson has actually become a filter for three thinkers. Because you have to, you have, to have some sense of, I'm not going to listen to what they think I should think about this guy to, to be interested in him. You have to go through the pain of kind of, my friends might judge me because I'm into this guy and come out the other side. And what was amazing in the responses in the comments was it really felt like he is this filter for free thinkers. Um, the, the vast majority of them were offering constructive criticism of, of us and constructive criticism of him and it felt like a very healthy conversation. Yeah, yeah, and I think I, I shared that kind of nervousness, um, maybe from me, from, from a different angle, which was the, you know, Peterson has had so much ad hominem attack um, from the media, uh, and also just outright lies as well. There's been a lot of that. Um, so there's a nuance to critiquing tactics, which I think was, was kind of the bulk of our podcast, critiquing an individual, which is really what the, the media has done, um, and which for me has no place in rebel wisdom. It's, it's, you know, it's the third thing is critiquing ideas. You know? And those things, you know, critiquing tactics um, in particular, I think is a really important thing. But also critiquing the delivery of those ideas. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, yeah. Um, which, which for me links into tactics as well. I think that what we're doing is offering it in the spirit of Peterson himself. What is not required is unconditional positive regard. What is required is genuinely wanting success and wanting the best of him and the best of this to succeed. And I hope that we are coming from that place. I mean, only other, I mean, people would make their own judgments, but I, I genuinely believe I've wrestled with this stuff, we've wrestled with this stuff, and we're trying to come from that place. Um, and so I just. Yeah, I just want to recap, just in case people are watching this without having watched the first podcast, we basically said three things. Um, that the message could be framed in a way that would reach people that are resistant to it at the moment. Um, that there, maybe he could look at retreating from some of the sort of daily combat, the media firefighting stuff. Kind of, he's, off, he's talked before about you shouldn't put pearls before swine. And maybe it's getting to that stage. And... Also that I am not seeing the same JP as I did a while ago, and it would be almost impossible for him to be the same because of the, the unfair attacks that he's had. But why the Cathy Newman interview worked was that he, it wasn't just that he had the facts and he outdid her on that level. There was a humor and a wit and a performance to that that won people over. And I actually messaged him after that he was still, um, he wasn't as famous as he is now, so I <laughs> got a reply at that point. Um, just to say, wow, fantastically well done on that interview. I, I know that that will reach people who were resistant already. Mm -hmm. And I don't see so much of that anymore. So that was kind of the other part of it. Yeah, and just to add to that point, um, after the Cathy Newman interview, um, he mentioned, you know, he talked about animus possession. And he talked about if you engage in the argument with, you know, with the energy Kathy Newman was coming from, you've already lost the argument. Um, and in a sense, I think the more he's delved into the mainstream media and the more they've started to kind of direct the conversation, the more and more it's been more difficult not to engage in that argument. You know? So I think that's, that's part of the kind of expanding out of the reason for those tactics being important, I think. Yeah, and one more point that actually came out in the writing of the article and in some of the feedback is, is there a deeper theological point 
or resolution than what Peterson's putting out there. Um, I'm going to unpack and explore that with Louise Mazzanti, who appeared in the Glitch in the Matrix film. Hello. So we thought it would be interesting to um, kind of delve into the comments and then pick out different critiques or ideas or things people were adding. Um, so the first one I wanted to talk about is um, in a couple of the comments, this idea of um, what I call like the fair weather friends argument of, you know, this is... Uh, this isn't the time to be criticizing Peterson, you know, he needs support right now, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. So, so what's your take on that? Um, I think this goes to the heart of what we were saying, really, the idea that polarization encourages this kind of us and them mentality. And ultimately, I think what Peterson is, is saying is trying to get us the other side of this. And this is something Eric and Brett Weinstein talked about in um, the Dave Rubin podcast, which is incredible. If anyone's not seen it, go and watch it. It's an amazing, amazing podcast. Um, they said that in the past, speaking out against, being ejected from your tribe would have been a fatal thing throughout most of human history. So we, we have this as a kind of internalized biological reality that this kind of them and us, this tribalism, which I would argue is why we're likely to wipe ourselves out if we don't evolve to the past this kind of reactivity. It's social media makes it worse, everything makes it worse. And at the moment, this kind of polarization or this kind of dynamic is, is, seems to be at its peak. And Peterson is the one man kind of lightning rod for this new culture wars. I think to add to that as well, there's, there's an interesting um, concept of you know, a tribe of individuals, very different from, from a different kind of tribe. Um, and I think a big part of Peterson's message is in, in the, the primacy of the individual, of your own experience and your own truth, um, and or speaking the truth. Certainly if I was going to pick a side, I know which side I'd pick, but I'm trying to kind of see that, is there a chance that we can get past this whole game of picking sides? Mm. Um, we might be naive, we might be wrong. Um, and I certainly felt in myself, as we put the stuff out there, this sort of sense of nervousness, and sense of kind of, is this right? Am I betraying something? Fighting with this other sense of no, this is my truth. This is what I have to add to the conversation. I, and I have to, and I have to add this. Like Peterson talks about, it's like things go corrupt when people don't speak their truth. And I might be wrong. I mean, this is an ongoing conversation. It's an ongoing. I'm, I mean, as another thing that he says, it's like, what the fuck do you know? I mean. <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> um, you know, you don't know enough by definition. I don't know enough by definition. We don't know enough by definition. We're all kind of l groping towards the truth as best we can, and this is what we're trying to do. And I, I believe that we're also like we're teaching men's work as well, and this is a core part of what we're teaching. It's like speaking your truth, giving your brothers honest reflections, and being really reflective of what is coming up in myself at the same time. Whether I'm just projecting my own kind of sense of superiority or whatever out onto the world, and, try, and we're in the process of trying to do that at the same yeah. time. And I think the key word is, is it's a process. It is a process of, like you've said, you know, you speak to know, you speak to think. Um, and it's a process in the men's work as well, of especially that um, people often find it difficult to reflect to, to you know, another guy in the group of, of the things of, hey, he, man, here's where I see your blind spots. And you know, in the groups, we go around and, and we'll kind of listen in on the circles and be like, and if someone is kind of falling into pleasing, of like, ooh, yeah, you can sometimes be a little bit mean, but you're really great otherwise. You know? It's like, you, you know, one of the things we often say is you're not serving, you're not helping him. You're not helping him by pleasing. The help will be reflection because we cannot see our own blind spots by definition. So why yeah, the shadow, that's why yeah. they're called yeah. yeah. So to move on to another question, um, a kind of a couple of comments around the theme of you guys have lost your nerve. Have you lost your nerve, David? It would have been much easier for us to carry on, and we are going to carry on doing sort of Peterson themed um, interviews and work because I think the the perspective that he's bringing is the most complete thing I've ever seen. And so we are going to use it as a window into other thinkers and a window into, into sort of broadening, um, broadening out as much as we can. Um, and it, it would have been much easier not to do this. So have we lost our nerve? I don't think so. 
one or two comments around, yeah, you piggybacked, you know, we've piggybacked on Peterson and then now we're stabbing him in the back by critiquing him. What, what are your thoughts on that? And also there was one guy who said, and that's not what men do. Men back each other up. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I genuinely have, I was genuinely concerned that he might think that as well. Like I actually sent him a message about that a while ago um, saying, look, I, I'm really trying to act ethically. Um, we, the interview you gave us really did give us a, a boost and allowed us to kind of attract attention with Rebel Wisdom. Um, and you up, he also uploaded the Glitch in the Matrix to his channel, which gave us another boost as well. Um, and I'm eternally grateful for that. Um, all I can do is explain where I'm coming from and how it's got to this point, and people can make their own judgments as to whether that's piggybacking on his success or not. Um, I used to be a journalist, well, I am a, I am a journalist, documentary maker, reporter. I've worked for Channel 4 News for many years. Um, I've made documentaries. I found Peterson July, no, June of last year, and I immediately became hooked. And I wrote the Medium article, Truth in the Time of Chaos, one of the first Medium articles, I think, about him, um, where I transcribed a load of his stuff and put a, I don't know, 3,000 words, something like that. Um, and it was because of that that I then got the interview with him. When I was going, I actually took the leap of going over to one of the Bible lectures and then thought, well, I'm a journalist, I might see if I can get an interview with him. Um, sent him the the article and he really liked it. He said he'd done it's a really careful job uh, and he was happy to do an interview, which I'm again very grateful for. And then after doing the interview, I then thought, well, and I, from the beginning I've been thinking there's a lot of people who are just not seeing this message. They're getting hung up on the political stuff, they're not seeing what he's actually about. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna make a documentary. And so I made Truth in the Time of Chaos to try and provide that kind of context to explain what he was really about, like the theological stuff. In the interview I did with him, we didn't talk about the trans stuff or the polit politics stuff at all. Mm. The least interesting thing about him, in my view, is the politics stuff. The most interesting thing is the deep, the deep mythological, the deep archetypal, the deep Jungian integration which he's bringing forward. And so a lot of what we talked about was about synchronicity and was about Jung and it was about this kind of deeper message. And so I put that, that documentary out and then the Kathy Newman interview happened. And I was kind of trying to liaise behind the scenes between him and Kathy for a while. And because that's what I thought, I mean, it was amazing synchronicity. We, we talked about synchronicity. That was basically the topic of our conversation. And synchronicity being like amazing coincidences that tell you something meaningful, like there's some, they're somehow meant to happen. And then he comes to the UK. I'm the only person who's done a documentary about him. He then leaps to fame on the show I used to work on with Kathy Newman, who is an ex-colleague of mine. And I, I messaged them both immediately after the interview, independently, to say to Peterson, as I just said, well, that, well done, that was amazing. I think the, the humor and the wit has probably won people over. And to Kathy to say, I really liked the, the, the way that you, you guys warmed to each other by the end. Because there was a kind of genuine kind of, kind of respect by the end. Um, and they both responded and, and then this whole thing blew up and I really felt, I was like, wow, this is an amazing position and I really wanted to kind of liaise between them for a while. That's what I thought I was meant to do. Yeah. Like, what's the meaning of the synchronicity? Well, you're meant to, to kind of try and help them renegotiate because on one side, Peterson was very upset or on one side, I know for sure that they were, it wasn't spin. Like, Kathy did feel under attack. Channel 4 News did feel under attack. It wasn't spin. Um, I do have my doubts about the, them calling in security experts or, or the fact that they put that out. I think, I mean, they're journalists. They know, how to, they know how to control the narrative. I do have my suspicions around them doing that, which I didn't at the time, but I developed them afterwards. But Peterson was very angry about the fact that it was now being spun as Kathy was a victim and all this stuff, and I completely understood his perspective as well, and I agree with it. But I also knew that from inside Channel 4 News, that's not what they were thinking. They genuinely were upset at, at the comments that Kathy was getting, and I know that privately they were getting some really horrific stuff. So it wasn't, I could see both sides, and I was trying to kind of liaise, and Peterson was interested in, in having a second interview and wanted to, to, to do it. 
Channel 4 News just wanted it to go away. So eventually I was like, okay, so what am I meant to do with this? I, and I realized, okay, I'll, I'll put out Glitch in the Matrix. Or just all of these ideas that have been sort of bubbling away about since the Trump election, I then downloaded into Glitch in the Matrix. Put it together in about two weeks. And I, I was in the Channel 4 News newsroom two weeks before I put that documentary out, freelancing there. And I freelanced there since I left. Um, I knew I would not be able to go back into that newsroom when I put that documentary out. Just there were criti criticisms of Channel 4 News in there. I was pretty much weighing into the debate around Cathy Newman where they just wanted to protect her at that time, understandably, because some, some of the abuse she was getting was really serious. And I knew it would make things incredibly difficult. So, but I made that decision at that point that I would, that that wasn't my path anymore. That actually this, creating rebel wisdom, outside the mainstream media has been the thing that I've decided to do. So I was kind of, I was accepting the possibility that I was ending my career in news and current affairs by doing, putting that out. I was being disloyal to them. So people can judge as to whether that's a sacrifice or not. And I think Peterson has probably made bigger sacrifices, but I think I have taken decisions that I think I do have skin in this game. So what you're saying is, we live in the Matrix. <laughs> what I'm saying is, yes, watch Glitch in the Matrix. <laughs> Another interesting question is, is, you know, people were asking, well, are we saying that Peterson should censor himself or should he, you know, should he change his tone? Um, what are your thoughts on that? I don't think he should stop speaking the truth. I think he should just do it smarter. Um, I think that... And this is something that Andrew Sweeney, who wrote a blog post alongside it, talked about, that this idea of the castration cult, the sort of great mother, and what we're seeing, if you kind of look at it from the archetypal perspective, the media is acting like a castration cult. Peterson needs to behave, he needs to stop being angry, he needs to do this. It's like this kind of lecturing, finger-wagging, kind of anti-masculine tone to a lot, of, a lot of it, which, and we're not saying Peterson needs to behave, and, but what I am saying is that I think he could frame it in a way that would that would reach more people um, and that I think he is because at, at first I was thinking well he's just speaking the truth and just allowing it to fall as it will it's fine if the media misrepresents him he's not playing the media game which I had some sympathy for but I, I don't think that's true I think he is playing the media game in some ways like Think about Milo. He's never been on Milo's show. I, I assume that Milo would want him in a heartbeat. Mm. He's made a decision not to go on Milo's show. I'm assuming, I might be wrong, I'm just speculating here, but he's gone on just about everyone else's. So he's made a decision to keep a distance from Milo. I think he's right to keep a distance from Milo. I think Milo is now damaged goods. Mm. And Milo is a kind of a textbook example of what can happen. Milo is a provocateur. Peterson's not a provocateur. He's, provoc he's provoking a response, but he's not doing it deliberately. Milo was doing it deliberately. So there was a kind of, he was playing with fire. And the danger with Peterson, like Milo's still doing okay. He's got his own podcast. He's probably never going to want for people to provide him money. He's still got a fan base. But he is, at, in terms of his influence on the national conversation or the international conversation, it's zero. He is now, he has been defanged and discarded by the national conversation. Peterson is too important for that to happen to. And I think he is a different character than Milo, and I think he has different motivations. With Milo, it was, just, it was a case of this was kind of bound to happen. He was a shooting star that was bound to flame out. I'm not convinced that, that Peterson is bound to flame out or should flame out. I think he's bringing something that's still going to be relevant in like 200 years' time, whereas I don't think Milo is. And <laughs> One of the reasons they dropped his book is it was complete shit. Um, if you read the reports, he's, he was saying, he was made a career out of saying things that no one else would say. But apart from that, he, he, he's, not, he's not an intellect. He's not on the same level as someone like Peterson. Yeah, that brings me to another point that kind of came up in the comments as well, which is um, slightly linked to it, this idea of, you know, well, you can't talk the radical left. There's no talking to them. There's no point in trying to win them over, you know, etc. 
the way I see the link to that is that the media, the mainstream media, is kind of the act, a big access point to the, to the kind of really radical SJWs. My thinking on that is that I think there's truth in that. I think the most radical extreme, they're not reachable by Peterson's message. They're, you know, but I don't think they're the majority by any means. In fact, the, the audience that the mainstream media allows you to talk to is the massive group of fairly reasonable, open-minded people on the left who really could use Peterson's message, who need to be red-pilled effectively. And that, that makes it matter the tactics you use to reach them because they are, they are being kind of shamed into having a certain worldview, which is based around shame, that kind of social justice worldview. And that's a strong pull on them of like, you're not allowed to listen to this person because it's, they have a deep concern with how you think, what you believe. And they can take things like hit pieces and make it a, a very effective tool to keep people there. So yeah, there's two things here. One, Peterson says that sanity is outsourced. Like sanity is such a complicated problem mm. that we outsource it to other people. Mm. In some ways we, we, we moderate our behavior by the reaction that we have from other people. Mm. So sense making is also outsourced. We, we, we all, to some degree, either we make up our own minds or we follow others, but we can't make up our own minds all the time. Like we all have these, we take cues from what other people like or from, mm. from people that we see on Twitter. It's impossible to make up our own minds entirely about every single thing all the time. We're always influenced by what other people are thinking and, and some kind of peer, not peer pressure, but, but peer, like our anchor points. Mm. So, and my worry is that Peterson has lost a lot of key anchor points who, who are not interested in sort of delving in deeper into his message. I, on my Twitter feed, I try and have a balance. I, I try and balance it with different perspectives. And I see a lot of reasonable, intelligent, left-leaning journalists who I consider open-minded and um, reachable, sharing sort of Peterson hit pieces and saying, well, I always knew there was something about this guy and now I've realized. So I feel like he's losing that center. So another thing that's come up in the comments is that what is most striking about the podcast is that all the advice we were giving Peterson applies much, much more to the regressive left, the kind of social justice mindset by a factor of like a million. Um, what are your thoughts? Yes, it's true. Yeah. It's absolutely true. It does. Um, it doesn't mean that that 2% or 5% is irrelevant. And I've written extensively about kind of the left's reactivity and we will talk a lot more about that. But it doesn't mean that there is nothing to learn on the other side. And I kind of reflect on Jocko Willink. Peterson's been on Jocko Willink's podcast. He talks about extreme ownership. The buck stops with me. He talks about when things went wrong on a, on a tour in Iraq, and he just said, it's my fault. Because if you say it's my fault, whatever reaction you're getting, whatever people are misunderstanding, if you say it's my fault, suddenly you're, you then have some ownership of it. If you just keep saying, no, it's just them, it's just them, they're doing this, they're doing this, then that's a very weak position to be in because you can't do anything about it. If you accept that you can do anything about anything, then you're empowering yourself. There's this other sense of, if you're in an argument with someone, you, and you can't seem to get through it, and you can tell they're being completely unreasonable, the only way out of that argument, either you kind of fight, or you don't see that person anymore. If you want to get through that argument, say it's a family member and you have no choice but to get through that argument, if you are seeing more of the dynamics than the person who is reacting to you, you're the only one that can shift that dynamic. Mm. Actually, is that unfair if they're being unreasonable? Yes, it's completely unfair. Tough, life is unfair. But you, the only person who can shift the dynamics is the person who's seeing the bigger picture. And I think Peterson has the capacity to see a bigger picture that the media just doesn't have. Um, and I do think there are, there are ways of, of framing that will at least kind of talk to the middle, if not, yeah, the extremes are kind of unreachable. Yeah. I think that Peterson, he's channeling like this, this old spirit of, of, of the divine masculine, mm -hmm. and it is absolutely essential. We cannot do without it. 
and he is channeling this thing into the culture in a big way. And his success is, shows how much we're thirsting for it, mm. this, this important masculine energy. But it needs to be matched by a, a feminine energy of equal power and weight because, and I think this is, this is why I think there is some truth in like the New York Times article that called him custodian of the patriarchy. I think on some level, I do think he may, and maybe quite rightly, is concerned about what's happened since the 60s. Like we have started sharing space between men and women. Is that gonna work out or is that not gonna work out? We don't know. It's clearly creating huge difficulties. And I think he's genuinely not sure whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. And I think people are picking up on that and criticizing him for it. But ultimately, we're not gonna wind the clock back. We are gonna have to go through and forward and find this synthesis which is going to be, as Jordan Greenhall talks about, what we have, and he also s frames it by saying these are very difficult conversations to have, these are hugely important, but very difficult conversations to have. We have the feminine rising into power. Power, and we also need the feminine to rise into responsibility at the same time. And those two things need to happen, need to happen at the same time. And it's, it's certainly true that women now have power to destroy men, destroy men's reputations, destroy men's careers, and that power, and it's, it's right that some people do have their careers destroyed and some people do have their reputations ruined. That's right. It, we, we're not going back to the 1950s sort of madmen culture, but also that with great power comes great responsibility. I think for me, what woke me up as a woman about Jordan Peterson was that he was beginning to talk about a longing in culture, a longing. We are in this time of chaos and where are the axioms? Where are the things that are true at a deeper levels? And you know, as women, we already know that there are these truths. We've just been really, really trained to not feel it and not speak it. And he speaks to that. but. And I really like the way that he's saying, hello men, where are you? Where is the divine masculine? Because the divine feminine has, has come massively into the world, not as a divine feminine, but you know that with a, a lot of shadow as well. Carly. Carly, exactly. Chopping off and saying enough. Yeah. But it's run amok. And we need the divine masculine. We need the strong, the deep, the mature masculine to stand up and say, I'm here. And we need, we need the feminine to do the same. And that's what I feel is, is what Peterson is, is pointing at, but missing out on. He's speaking more, he's speaking more to men, he's speaking more to the masculine. It, I don't feel that he's saying the feminine is not important at all, but he's no. creating a space. And I want women to stand up and say, okay, what is this space from a woman's perspective? How can we fill this space? But this, and this also you were just saying, the divine feminine is showing up a lot as Carly at the moment. Mm -hmm. Brilliant kind of archetypal framework. And it's like, and it's absolutely right that she does because men need to find their, their grounding. Men need to find their balls. Men need to find, to stand in their masculinity and say, enough. Women test men to, to see how grounded they are. Mm -hmm. that, that happens automatically, it needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Women evolutionarily, that has to happen. Women have to test men. Like, you, women had a far bigger investment in childbirth and bringing up children. And so women constantly test men. They, it's an evolutionary necessity. And it's actually something that's very valuable to men to, for that to happen. It's like, that's how we evolve, is, is, is through that kind of being tested and standing in our truth and standing in our masculinity. And women are very, there's this kind of idea of men or concept Men test ideas and women test men. Now it's very easy to misunderstand that and say, well, do you mean women don't have ideas? That's outrageous. Da, da, da. No, but that has always been the truth. W women have a much more direct kind of sense of when someone's really aligned, when someone's really grounded. So men may test ideas, but they may not be connected to any sort of deeper emotional truth and they can go off on all sorts of directions. Women in the past have been really good at kind of seeing where the alignment is. And I think men are developing more emotional intelligence and more able to do that than before, but I still think women have a, 
a deeper lived biological reality of really, really seeing that deeper alignment. And that's why the Me Too discussion, again, that's why it's really interesting because it shows these dynamics because what's been happening right now is that women have really, really gone for men and really, really testing and say, speaking up, challenging. And what's happened is that men have kind of retreated to the corner, gotten defensive or have really lost their masculinity, given away their balls. And what we are not seeing is that men are stepping up and saying, okay, enough, but from a grounded perspective, from a perspective of hearing and embracing the pain, but also saying there's, there's a limit here because the feminine needs that. that it's, it's no fun if we keep running and running and, and, and nailing men per se on everything, like creating a society where, where, where men are dangerous for women. And this is what, you know, that's, that's a danger for what's happening if, if we don't have a much more balanced conversation about this. Because as women, we don't want all the power. We want, we want to share that space. And, and it seems like we've both forgotten that. We're so, we're so engaged in the antagonism, in clearing the space, that we forget why we're clearing it. What, what, I'm going to come back to what do we want to fill that space with? Mm. What does the synthesis look like? What, does the, what, what would a healthy relationship look like? Mm. I love this question because this is the most open question we can have right now. I don't have the answer. This is what we're developing together right now. This is why I want to say to my, my sisters, all the women out there, come on, let's do that. Let's find out what is it to be a woman because we've forgotten. We, we, we've totally cut off from, from those roots and let the men figure out what is it about to be a man and let's come together and see what happens in that space. If we are all the same in postmodernism, nothing is happening. This is why we see our society is in, is in a, a complete crisis. This is only gonna get worse because we don't have we don't have a solution right now. And this is why we need a co-creation, a synthesis to go to the next level. We can't go to the next level on our own. The resources, the, the physical resources of the planet, the mental resources our, of our thinking, they are exhausted. They are not creating that next level that we need to go to and this is why for me this whole discussion between men and women between the feminine and the masculine these archetypes they are so essential because they are leading us to the next point of evolution so i don't have the answer what no. is that but i i want to say let's find out